And then the two other facts of life. What does our Torah say? Achremot Kedushin, right? After death, holiness. When a man dies or a woman dies, they turn into saints. You never went to a, a, a funeral where the rabbi gets up and says, let's talk talkless, he was a son of a bitch. <laughs> you never hear that. You never, never hear that. So I only mention this to you because after King Hussein died, he became a saint. Now, King Hussein, among Arab leaders, was the best of a bad lot. But King Hussein made two great mistakes, really, that cost his country and cost him very, very dearly, and cost the Palestinians very, very dearly. Mistake number one is he entered the Six-Day War. He should not have entered. He swallowed Nasser's misinformation. And the consequence of that is he lost Jerusalem, and he lost the West Bank. He should not have entered the Six-Day War. His second mistake was, in the Yom Kippur War, he does not enter the war. That's a time when Israel is reeling. Had he used his relatively well-trained and well-equipped Jordanian army against the Israelis, he would have put Israel in great danger and would probably have recovered something of what he had lost in the Six-Day War. But by staying out of the war, he frees up Israeli forces on the Jordanian front. That's going to help Israel as well. And then, and here is where you see human nature and realpolitik play a very, very interesting role. No one in the United States would ever accuse Richard Nixon of, a ma of being a man that liked Jews. Whether he was an anti-Semite or not, in an American context, yeah, you could say he's a mild anti-Semite. The tapes reveal him talking about how the Jews are always liberals, the Jews are always out to get him, and so on. But this man was a shrewd, we would say, a shrewd cookie. This man understood realpolitik. And so as Israel reeled back and ran out of crucial weapons, Richard Nixon, the evidence would indicate, not Schlesinger, not Kissinger, not Weinberger, not any of them, that the real issue here was it was Richard Nixon. It is Richard Nixon that okayed the massive resupply of weapons and ammunition to Israel in the middle of October. It was not done as a consequence of a burst of philo-Semitism. The evidence is very clear on this. But Nixon understood again some basic facts of life. He is reputed to have told a reporter after the war, why did you resupply the Israelis? And Nixon is supposed to have said, it was a very simple decision. Their guys were beating our guys. That is, the protégés of the Soviet Union, the Egyptians and the Syrians, were beating a country that was long linked with the United States. If the United States let Israel go down, then what, was, what would be worth, how much would it be worth the alliance system that the United States had constructed with a whole host of countries? The prestige of the United States was on the line here, not out of any love for the Israelis, but it was on the line for the United States if Israel went down the tubes. So the resupply takes place. And there's an interesting aspect to that resupply, which again will have an impact upon Israeli thinking. I told you that the Israelis always have to think about the United States. They will think even more about the United States. One, because of the resupply, and then because of an unfortunate fact of life. When the United States wanted those planes resupplying the Israelis to land at European bases, not one NATO country agreed to allow American planes resupplying the Israelis to land at air bases. It is only as a result of great pressure that the small and relatively weak country of Portugal allowed American planes to refuel in the Azores, and from there they went on to Israel. For Israelis, the sense of isolation was absolutely complete. And so, therefore, 
Again, the resupply comes in. The Israelis show pluck, show a great deal of skill, good commanders, a great deal of courage. The war turns. The Syrians are not only held, they are thrown back. And because of Sharon and because of other Israeli commanders and above all the courage and the skill of Israeli soldiers, the greatest tank battle since the Second World War takes place. The Israelis clean the Egyptian clock. Sharon in the middle of October crosses over the canal and surrounds the large third Egyptian army. Enter into this Henry Kissinger. Kissinger delivers an ultimatum to the Israelis. Don't strangle the third Egyptian army and don't move on to Cairo. And when the Israelis, let us say, oppose what he is saying, when they say, listen, we took the hit, we've suffered large casualties, don't cheat us out of a total military victory. Kissinger's response is, if you don't relax the stranglehold and allow the Egyptians to resupply their army, I will send in American helicopters that will resupply the third Egyptian army, and you will be in the dubious position of, if you want to refuse them, you'll have to shoot down American planes and American helicopters. The fact of the matter is, no Israeli government is going to do that. And there's something else that had to be said. I, like many of you, and the overwhelming majority of Israelis, were absolutely convinced at the time Kissinger had stabbed Israel in the back and deprived Israel of the victory that it deserved. But at least in retrospect, one can say, and it's hard for me to say it, Henry Kissinger was right. He was right because a complete or total defeat for the Egyptians would have made it impossible for Anwar Sadat to go to Jerusalem four years later. An Egyptian government smarting under another humiliating defeat would never have begun to initiate peace negotiations with the Israelis. It is as simple as that. Kissinger understood this. And remember, I'm telling you now what I tell my students ad nauseum in class, and that is what is important in history is not reality. What is important in history is perception. Perception is reality. If you go to Cairo today and you talk to Egyptians, the Yom Kippur War, first of all, is called the War of Ramadan. And second, the Egyptians perceive it as a great Egyptian victory. And Anwar Sadat was hailed in Egypt as the hero of the crossing. And if you go to Cairo today, you go on a tour, depending if it's a young tour guide, a chauvinistic Egyptian, he will take you to a museum that commemorates the 1973 war. And in that museum, you will see captured Israeli tanks, captured Israeli equipment, and all sorts of discussions about how the Egyptians defeated the Israelis. Perception is reality. It means that the war is going to shape this, the peace settlement and, of course, the years to come. Let's deal on the Egyptian side. What does it mean? It means that Anwar Sadat now has the proper yichas. I attacked, I had the guts to attack the Israelis, and I inflicted massive casualties upon them. We have restored the honor that was lost in 1967, and partial honor of what was lost in 1948. We inflicted 3,000 dead, we rocked Israel to its very core. In addition to that, there are other things that Anwar Sadat is going to learn. One is a more sober assessment. We hit the Israelis with everything we had. We had the element of surprise, and in the end, whatever is said publicly, the Israelis turned the tide. Any dream of liquidating or eliminating Israel from the face of the earth it's not going to take place. And a third consequence on Sadat's part is, yeah, the Soviet equipment was good, but the major player on this planet, the one without which there can be no agreement, the one which can help us bail out our sick economy, there's only one country that can do that, 
and that is the United States. And the road to Washington, D.C. runs through Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. That is, if you want American assistance, if we want American economic assistance, we must engage in negotiations with the Israelis. That's why Anwar Sadat is going to initiate those secret negotiations with the Israelis. On the Israeli side, the consequences are also going to be consequential and very, very sobering. 3,000 Israeli dead. To put that in a context, again, the population of the United States at that time was approximately 200 million. That is about 35 to 40 times the population of Israel. So what would it mean for the United States? The equivalent of losing, let's say, about 120,000 men. The total number of Americans lost in 12 years of fighting in Vietnam was less than 60,000. In three weeks' time, the Israelis lost the equivalent of 120,000 American soldiers. A sobering thing for any Israeli diplomat, prime minister, politician, or for the overwhelming majority of Israeli citizens. We have been bled, and we have been bled badly. Maybe now it is time to look for a negotiated settlement, at least with the Egyptians. The second thing, of course, is when it's all over, the Israelis, who are accustomed to lightning victories, after all, six days in 67, 96 hours in 56, smashing victories for the Israeli armed forces, it's not that way in 1973. So the Israelis set up a special commission. That's the Agronaut Commission, to look into what happened. And when the Agronaut Commission looked in, they are coming to come to a number of conclusions. The Israeli army was ill-prepared. They should have had enough equipment. They didn't even have eating utensils, enough eating utensils for its soldiers. We were ill-equipped, the Agronaut Commission says. That was a serious mistake. There was a breakdown in intelligence. We've got to improve our intelligence. And to use what is now a current American expression, the Agronaut Commission came to the conclusion there is no substitute for boots on the ground. You gotta have large numbers of soldiers, more than the 500 that stood at the Barlev line. I must tell you, not all of the Barlev line was taken, but most of it was taken, and of course the Israel, excuse me, the Egyptians passed it by. There's got to be better ground co better coordination between Israeli air power and those forces on the ground. It wasn't as good as it should have been. And perhaps most significant of all, remember, you lose, you, take, you look a little bit more critically than before. The Israelis now began to understand that they had better develop what is, what is called avionics. There's got to be a better way that Israeli aircraft can avoid those ground-to-air missiles. 20% of the Israeli Air Force was shot down in the first 48 hours of the war. We've got to do a better job, and that eventually will be done. Just don't to jump ahead. The lesson will be learned because in 1982, in Operation Peace for the Galilee, the Israelis in a half hour will destroy the ground-to-air installations in the Bekaa Valley and shoot the Assyrian Air Force out of the sky and not lose any Israeli planes. The Israelis had learned the lesson of the Yom Kippur War. On a political front, of course, somebody's got to pay a price. Golda Meir will pay that price. And I think it's a justifiable price. She did not prepare the country well for the war. She did not make the great decisions. Two Israeli politicians were far more popular outside of Israel than they were in Israel. I cannot speak for your country and my country. Everybody loved Abba Ibn. Abba Ibn was not so popular in Israel. And everybody, especially women, loved Golda. Everybody loved Golda. But in that crunch, Golda may not have acted in the correct way. She will be punished. And so, too, will be punished will be the Labour Party. That is the moderate socialist party 
that had governed Israel ever since 1948. You cannot conceive of what happened in the 1977 elections unless you see it against the backdrop of the Yom Kippur War. The ultimate outsider, Menachem Begin, now becomes the Prime Minister of Israel. A very, very interesting piece of work. Menachem Begin, the man from the Yirgun, the man considered not only by the British, but by most Israelis to be a terrorist, this is the man that now comes and becomes the Prime Minister of Israel. And this is very important. Why does he become the Prime Minister of Israel? Again, most significant because of that those experiences in the Yom Kippur War, but also of something else. We all knew it when we went to Israel. We all knew that it was there. But when we went to Israel, I speak of most of us, myself, most American Jews, most Canadian Jews, we didn't have much contact with those Israelis. We had contact with Israelis like ourselves, people who came from Europe, Ashkenazic Jews, right? We usually had contact middle-class Ashkenazic Jews. Some of them even spoke Yiddish. Many of them spoke Yiddish. Many of them were Holocaust survivors. But there was always a second Israel. The second Israel came from Yemen. The second Israel came from Iraq came from Libya, came from Syria, came from Morocco, that second Israel. We never had contact with them, but they were growing in numbers. And they got nothing as they perceived it from the labor governments. Now they vote as they had voted before. So the combination, they voted for the Likud. And so what's going to happen? The combination of the votes of the second Israel, which out began to outnumber Ashkenazic Jews in the country, together with the, the experiences of the Yom Kippur War, propel Menachem Begin into power. That's very, very important. For Begin looks at the world differently than Labour did. Just to give you an idea, I had the good fortune in 1978, on one of my trips to Israel, to meet with 11 other academicians, to meet with Golda Meir. We had lunch with Golda. Two things I will tell you. One, I have never met man or woman, anybody as tough as Golda. I know, I mean, this woman was tough. And the second thing is, I never met anybody that chain smoked as much. We were there for two or three hours. She must have gone through three packs of cigarettes. But what is most interesting and most important is she excoriated Begin. She excoriated him for agreeing to, let us say, make concessions in Egypt. For her, the crucial issue was the West Bank. For her, you hold on to Egypt. That was her experience in the 56 war. We conquered the Sinai, you gotta hold on to it. That's where the attack came from on Yom Kippur. That's where the attack is going to come again. Make concessions on the West Bank. Give the Palestinians, if not a state, turn it over to Jordan. Give it to them. But hold on to the Sinai. It became clear to me, and I think every other academician that was there, that if Golda Meir was the Prime Minister of Israel in 1977, there would never have been the Camp David Accords. Begin, on the other hand, of course, believes that that's part of Israel, Judea and Samaria. What in English is called the West Bank, that's ours. This is the old Jabotinsky man speaking. That's our land and you don't give it back. But when it came to Egypt and the Sinai, that was a different story. So what does Begin do? He's got to make the tough call. Here is what I think goes through his mind. Sadat has told him, you want peace? Sadat has told the Knesset. You want peace with Egypt? You gotta give us back every inch of the Sinai. Every single inch of the Sinai, including your beautiful settlement of Yamit. And you've gotta give us back Sharm el Sheikh. You gotta give it all back to us. Begin, before the election, had come close to swearing on a pack of Bibles, we'll never give them back Sharm el Sheikh. We'll never give them back El Arish. And certainly we will not give them back Yamit. He gives it all back. 
And he gives it back because I think he reasoned as follows. If I hold on to the Sinai, I have strategic depth, I have the oil of the Sinai, and I have Yamit. That's what I have if I hold on to the Sinai. But if I, if I hold on to the Sinai, I will never have peace with Egypt. Do you understand what I'm saying? If I give it up, there's a chance for peace with Egypt. And what Begin does is to use the colloquial expression, he bites the bullet. He agrees to give it up. And he gets that peace with Egypt. And Begin, who had a very good word away with words, Begin came to the United States and laid it out to an American Jewish community that was very skeptical of his making concessions, giving back the Sinai. And he put it this way. Only a man that had a great sense of Jewish history, like Begin had, could put it. He said to an American audience and to an Israeli audience, this isn't peace between Egypt and Israel. This is peace between Mitzrayim and Eretz Yisrael. The Hebrew word Mitzrayim for Egypt connotes a long-standing hostility and tension and war going on for eons, for millennia, between Egypt and Israel. We have made peace with the greatest and the most traditional of our enemies. Now, he doesn't use what I'm about to say, but the thrust of it is, that's not chop liver. That is a significant event. And so, it has enormous consequences for what is going to come. Whatever the difficulties Israel has had with Egypt, if you shoot back at me, it is the coldest of pieces. And that is absolutely correct. That is, the Egyptian people are filled with animosity towards the Israelis. Probably large numbers of Egyptians want to scrap the Camp David Accords. But the fact of the matter is, whatever has happened since 1977, 78, and 79, despite P Operation Peace for the Galilee in 1982, despite the attack upon, Iraq, upon the Assyric reactor in 1981, it doesn't make any difference. The peace has held, despite going into Gaza, despite fighting two wars in Lebanon, the war, the peace has held, and that is a significant event. And then something else that pertains to my country, and that is the oil embargo really hit America very, very hard. And I can tell you, many American Jews were frightened. What are they going to say? And in fact, there were signs. Gas the Jews. We want gas, gas the Jews. The Jews brought about the embargo. But those were solitary voices. In the end, America or the people of the United States did not turn against Israel, did not turn against the American Jewish community. There was no dramatic eruption of anti-Semitism in the United States. That would give great confidence to the American Jewish community to deal with the future. So in short, the war changed a lot. Unfortunately, every, all Israelis think that the war that they fight is always going to be the last war. Unfortunately, it was not the last war. I'm not preaching gloom and doom, but who knows when the next war is going to come. But as Trotsky said in a famous statement, war is the locomotive of history. War changes everything. War changed the Middle East, the Middle East that you and I now deal with in the year 2013. Thank you very much.